discreet as to sit at the back of the room, uh, maybe to come closer to us, we would feel much better. And also I think we might uh, engage in a more interactive conversation. Uh, thank you very much indeed. So my name is Christine Okrent. I'm a journalist from Paris, France. And uh, I have the privilege to moderate what is indeed a key session in the world of today where we see that globalization also entails all sorts of problems having to do with public health at a scale which had been unknown until now. Uh, the angle we will discuss this afternoon has to do with the attitude of the business community towards HIV AIDS. We all know the pandemic burst out some 25 years ago, but governments in the first place and certainly big business particularly were slow to realize to what degree that particular pandemic would eventually affect the very fabric of our societies, not only in the rich countries, but obviously also in the developing world. We, are, uh, we have the privilege to have with us this afternoon uh, Peter Piot. Peter is the executive director of UNAIDS, uh, Under Secretary General of the United Nations. Um, he's Belgian, I'm happy to say, uh, and he's been in charge of UNAIDS uh, since uh, the very beginning, and he's certainly the expert in the world who knows best about the overall issues. We, uh, next to him, we have Bo Shao, who is chairman of Novamed Pharmaceuticals, uh, China. Um, Shao is also a young global leader. Uh, Rajat Gupka, senior partner, McKinsey, uh, chairman of the board, the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria. Mr. Gupka is also a member of the foundation board of the World Executive Forum. Reynette Taljard comes from South Africa. Uh, and she runs a foundation, the Helen Sussman Foundation, uh, which is devoted to promoting democracy and uh, values in that very important African country. Um, Peter, may I uh, start by asking you to, to give us maybe a very brief uh, uh, outline of what, in your view, is the state of the fight against AIDS today. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Christine. And uh, yes, where are we? Um, and, and what are the lessons of the last 25, 26 years? Because AIDS was uh, described for the first time in uh, 1981. Um, the first lesson is basically that anything can happen. Anything can happen. It's not only a song by Wycliffe Jean, for those who like uh, the kind of music, but uh, uh, it means that um, in our times, uh, new issues, new diseases, new epidemics uh, really can come up. Ironically, when I was in last year in medical school and I went to around professors and asked for what should I do, and I was interested in infectious diseases and so on, and they said, no future, forget it. In the meantime, I don't know how many new infectious uh, issues have come up from mad cow disease to uh, SARS to... Uh, to AIDS, which is the biggest of all. So in something that we didn't know that existed 25, six years ago, has become now the fourth cause of death in the world, the fourth, um, out of nothing. Um, 8,000 people are killed every day. That's what, uh, 20 jumbo jets, um, as many people per day as were killed in the tsunami. Um, AIDS is now one of the make or break issues of our time in the same league as climate change and uh, uh, some of the other big problems. And two years ago when I met with Premier Wen, he told me and he said he started by saying AIDS is a new type of security issue. 
And I think that is a very good summary of what it is because it threatens stability, societies, and it's a, it's a major risk factor for it. So that's my, my, my second point, and that is that the AIDS epidemic is an illustration of the globalization of risks. And globalization of risk, in this case, dealing with sex and drugs. Um, it means also that from a, for any organization in the 21st century, in a world where risk awareness and risk assessments are becoming a, a normal part of uh, any uh, organization's work, that AIDS should certainly be on that agenda and a key issue to, be, uh, to consider. Um, even in Asia, where after all, um, the HIV prevalence is still fairly low, but it's growing. And we should remember that AIDS is not a disease of poverty. It's a disease of inequality. It's a disease that has to do with um, disparities in society. And uh, a light went up me a few years ago in Shanghai when I had a drink with a few Chinese friends. And they, one of them said, don't you know AIDS? It's about 3M. I, and I only knew the company 3M, but there's nothing to do. 3M, mobile men with money. But it's also about mobile men without money. 150 million floating populations, migrant, internal migrants in China, high risk for HIV. But it's also the entrepreneurs. It is something that we see growing where there is societies in rapid transition, be it here in China, be it in uh, Vietnam, be it in Indonesia, be it in um, in, in, in uh, uh, India, and that's because it's about sex, and that's unlike any other, um, any other disease. Third lesson and uh, conclusion is that it's a problem with a solution. We can do something about it. Uh, we have now firm evidence from most continents that uh, we can reduce the number of new infections through education programs, communication, I always say that journalists and leaders and imams and priests, they can uh, save more lives than doctors once uh, in terms of preventing new infections. Once somebody is infected, you need a medical system. Um, and what has been key on this beginning return on the investment? This year, $10 billion as will be spent on AIDS in the developing world. A lot of money. And it's thanks to leadership to the joint action of the Global Fund. We'll hear more about that from Rajat. Uh, UNAIDS, making the money work in countries, and also um, the leadership by the US in terms of the President's Emergency Plan on AIDS Relief, and I should say, AIDS activism. And my last point is that, um, fourth point is that, now we need a long-term view. We are having initial results, 25 years in the epidemic, we should now realize that AIDS is going to be with us for quite a while. It's not going to go away. And it is becoming a long wave issue. Climate change is becoming a short wave issue, acute crisis. AIDS is now having, going to have impact across generations. And uh, it has, you know, we have to look at it. What, um, who is going to finance the treatment? Um, and the summary of it all is that in AIDS, the history, country after country, is act now or pay later, and act now particularly to prevent new infections. For every person put on treatment in the world today, there are six new infections. So our current approaches really have to be better balanced with both treatment and prevention. So I would say that in conclusion that um, there is a very strong business case, we'll, we'll hear that later on. Um, it's not to ask for favors from any business, it's part to have um, a good, healthy workforce to work in an environment that is good for business. And from day one, UNAIDS has been working a lot with business, never asking for money from business, but asking that business play its part with the workforce, non-discriminatory education programs, um, using the skills of business, be it McKinsey, Accenture, to uh, you know, make programs more efficient, um, communication with MTV, um, and so on. So I will be very interested in hearing also from those business people present here how you are tackling it. Thank you. Peter, just one uh, quick answer from you. Uh, you, you say uh, HIV AIDS is the fourth cause of, of death. death. For men and, some, and women. Some people are sometimes surprised that there is so much 
public emphasis put on HIV AIDS as opposed to other illnesses which actually kill far more people all over the world. Can you explain to us what the chain of illnesses is in a way? Yes, uh, it's uh, well, cardiovascular diseases are um, higher up. Uh, I can't remember what the second and the third are, but AIDS is the first infectious disease cause. And at the rate that it goes now, it will be in a few years' time the, the third cause of death. So it's definitely not a marginal problem at all. Um, but it depends where you are. The burden of disease is still mostly in Africa. But when you take Asia, for example, countries like Thailand, Cambodia, Myanmar are very seriously affected. And what is unique is that AIDS kills uh, in the most productive years. Uh, infectious diseases or chronic diseases kill either very young people, I mean infants and so on, or older people. AIDS straight in the middle when you're supposed to produce, reproduce and so on. And, uh, and that's where the major impact for society comes from. And the second thing I'd like to say is that um, what we see is a major trend of feminization of the epidemic. Let's not forget, in 1981, it was about five homosexual men in America, white men. Today, half of all people with HIV are women. And it's going up in every region in the world, in every country. Before I turn to you, uh, Mr. Gupta, I would like to ask Rubai Kawada. Uh, Mr. Kawada is a member of the upper house of the Japanese parliament. He's a homophiliac and he uh, is now HIV positive because of blood transfusion. Please tell us about the situation in your country. Hello, uh, my name is Kawada, Ryuhei Kawada. I have just been elected member of the Japanese upper house. I'm HIV positive. So I was born with blood disease. The disease is called hemophilia. This means I had to take the medicine product protected from human blood when I was 10 years old. My mother told me that I got infected with HIV. Since the medical medicine I took has been contaminated with the virus. Ever since, I have lived with the fear of suffering from AIDS and also lived with anger and frustration because AIDS killed many of my friends, one after another. They have taken the medicine produced from the contaminated blood. Together with other patients, I decided to take this matter to court. We wanted to make clear why we had to became, become infected with HIV and who was responsible for it. There is little chance of win, said most people. We were suing the government and the major pharmaceutical company, but I was feeling very strongly that we must win at all costs, and we were determined to fight with all our pride. Many HIV positive persons remain anonymous for fear of the social prejudice, but I came out with my face and real name when I was 19 years old. I did not want to hide myself from the discrimination and the injustice. I really wanted to live with dignity. I was not sure and I was a bit afraid of how people would respond to my coming out. But many young people asked themselves what they could do to solve this problem and stood up for us, realizing it was their own problem. During the court case, it became clear that the pharmaceutical company kept providing contaminated blood products for their profit. And the expert doctors and the bureaucrats of the Ministry of Health did not stop it, even though they were well aware of the danger of the virus infection. The human chain of 3,500 people surrounded the health ministry building in solidarity with the victims of this medical crime, crime that appeal moved many more people nationwide and an um, epoch-making legal dis 
this decision was reached. The case was settled out of court and the Ministry of Health made an official apology. However, even this legal victory did not change the corrosive relationship among politicians, bureaucrats, industry, scholars, and the medical doctors. Money and, money and industrial benefits always precede life and human rights in the present day Japanese society. Not to repeat the tragedy, I realize the importance of the individual consciousness and education. So I started teaching at the colleges, uh, colleges and given lectures all over the country. By learning together and by taking to each other, people realize the value of life and human. The spirit of, play, spirit of peace and democracy grows out of this process. To turn what I believe into action, I ran for the upper house of parliament and was elected. People supported the case, case cause for which I stand. A word about taking AIDS, tuck, uh, so, sorry. A word about tackling AIDS, especially in the context of developing countries, getting medication to people who need it is critical. Those of us in this room are part of the solution from, the, from both the private and public sector. We need to realize, though, that conditions need to be in place on ground for the medication to make a difference. These are uh, issues of clean water, nutrition, sanitation, the issue of poverty. Unless the underlying condition is there, we will not have the result that we are looking for. We need an um, overall poverty strategy. Since Japan is changing the G8 next year, this is something that we need to play a role in highlight, highlighting. We also need to address discrimination. Discrimination is an issue not only in developing countries, but we, we, we see it also in Japan. Let's face the fact that the enemy lies at home around the world. Educational change is needed, and I will work on this in Japan and around the world. What is needed in a holistic view on people's lives? Medication is an important part of that life, but these are other we need to attend to. To see people's lives holistically, empathy is needed. Empathy allows us to see the people. My election in P Japan is a testimony to the fact that the people have this empathy. I would like to see this empathy spread across stakeholders and around the world. Thank you. Please also participate in Table 42 and uh, um, initiative by young global leaders to extend empathy. Thank you very much. So, thank, thank you. you very much indeed. Thank you so much for that courageous and at the same time uh, enticing testimony because it shows that there are solutions and there are democratic solutions. And I think it's uh, a great encouragement to all, all of us because it makes us realize that we all have a part to play. And we thank you really very much indeed. And we know that unfortunately you have to leave us. I think you have a plane to make. And so we really thank you for having been with us this afternoon. Uh, Mr. Gupta, may I turn to you? you you're the, the chairman of the board of the Global Fund, uh, which has become a powerful body 
uh, of the private sector getting together to address an issue which is very much business related in the sense that there are many global companies operating in those countries where many people are affected by uh, HIV AIDS. So tell us today, what is the attitude of the business community? Do you find it that it's easier for you to convince more and more business partners to join the Global Fund? Well, let me um, first start by saying that the, uh, as the title of the session implies, the, the case for uh, business is uh, very easy and very simple to make. I mean, any business operates, uh, you know, on the basis of a healthy workforce and it operates at the permission of society and therefore has the responsibility to contribute to it. The other thing we have noticed uh, is that almost any problem today, any issue you take, in, whether it be in health or whether it be in security, whether it be in other issues, that really none of the different sectors can by themselves solve it. If you think about health issues or education or other areas, government alone cannot solve it, civil society alone cannot solve it, and business alone cannot solve it. It's only when we work together that you can actually attempt to get, make a major difference. So I'll start by saying that the Global Fund was based on that premise of public-private partnership between business, governments, and civil society. Now to your question of saying, is it easier, where, where does the business stand in terms of really contributing to this cause, there is no easy answer to this. And I've been involved in uh, the Global Fund right from its inception, representing the private sector. And again, it was a very, um, let's say, a mixed message. When we went out to business, uh, certainly in countries where there is a dramatically increasing incidence and a very high disease load, you do get businesses quite active. I mean, certainly in South Africa with Anglo and, and, and various other companies. Uh, but at the same time, it was very difficult to get business involved in the global fund, in the fight against AIDS on a general basis saying, you know, please contribute, uh, you know, large sums of money, which uh, is what the general ask was. It missed the point that business actually uh, can contribute a lot more than just simply money. So let me actually illustrate the role that I think business can play and should play and increasingly is playing in the fight against AIDS by saying what are the priorities of the Global Fund and what can it do, what, what can business do in those priorities as I see them. So the first priority of uh, Global Fund, by the way, those of you who don't know Global Fund, it's, uh, it, it was roughly created about five years ago. It is uh, a, a financing mechanism to fight uh, the three largest killers in infectious diseases, which is AIDS, malaria, and tuberculosis. So it's the Global Fund for AIDS, malaria, and tuberculosis. It has steadily grown from a standing start to, uh, you know, roughly funding. It has deployed roughly seven to eight billion dollars so far in uh, around the world, operating in 130 different countries. It operates through a, a country coordinating mechanisms, which are public-private partnerships. So after five years, where does it stand and what are the priorities and how can business play a role in it and what does business do? The first thing to say is that obviously, you know, today we have, uh, you know, roughly 15,000 people a day die of these three diseases. Roughly, we are preventing about from the baseline, and these are obviously, as you can imagine, estimates, about 3,000 of these deaths, which means we're really maybe 20% along the fight. Um, so, resources need to be dramatically ramped up. 
although they have been dramatically ramped up in the last five years, we are nowhere where it needs to be. It needs to grow much faster, much more. And to put it in context, though, this is small amount of resources compared to what we spend, and of course, in any little war or something like that. So, you know, even though we are spending, you know, you might say 10, let's say even $10 billion a year, this is a quite a small amount in a global sense. So we need to scale up the amount of resources that are being spent in to fight these three diseases, and especially AIDS. So resource mobilization is clearly a very important topic. Now, what can business do as the impact is clearly there? And, and Peter talked about it. We are actually having an impact, even though today you see huge amount of new infections coming on. So we are still at a point where things are rising. But we are having an impact from the baseline. So resources uh, can be raised, and business is getting convinced that these resources can be effectively deployed and is coming forth. Two things to say in that. One is there are a number of innovating mechanisms that can be created. Uh, one of them is, uh, just to pick an example, is many of you probably know about the, the RED campaign, which is really to uh, you know, launch RED products that then uh, contribute back towards uh, fighting these diseases. And to date, this year, we have raised over $30 million contributing to that, to the Global Fund, through this campaign. Business is also coming up with uh, co-investment with the Global Fund. And that is increasing uh, and, and workplace programs and so on. But I must also say that sometimes the civil society nor the governments truly understand what business can contribute. More than financial resources, business can contribute in management, in capabilities like distribution, and so on. And that is not being fully harnessed as yet. In fact, in the Global Fund, we tried over the last several years to actually bring in in-kind contributions, i.e. in-kind contributions by businesses to add to the resources of the Global Fund. So far, the Global Fund has not adopted it as a policy, and frankly, you know, even though I am the chair of it, I'm on the board and I've been fighting for it, I cannot understand why it has not accepted it. So resource mobilization is one big priority. The second big priority is actually making the public-private partnerships at the country level work. In many of these cases, the partnerships locally are not what it is. It's basically run by the government. And I think the more and more we open it up to a true partnership, that will be helpful. And the Global Fund has recently taken a decision to say that not only are we going to give the funds to government programs, but we're going to have principal recipients being civil society and private sector, which is a change in our policy, which will be very advantageous and, and will involve the business and the civil society sectors much more. Just you, one quick yes. question, if I may, uh, yes. at this point. There are some countries where you have uh, corporations which actually set up uh, by their own means the only health system available. So the, isn't there a danger there? Uh, and, and I believe it happens in a few smaller African countries in particular, that there is indeed, if not a privatization of the health system, but somehow a fragility if that particular corporation decides to leave or decides to, to change focus, what happens? Well, I, I certainly would not recommend that. I think uh, health systems overall are a public good and should be the responsibility of the government to provide. That does not mean that the private sector cannot have a very strong role in it and cannot contribute to it and cannot bring its capabilities. So. All I can say about that is that, you know, there ought to be responsible governments who take up it providing that provision as a, as a public good. I think health in general, I think, is actually a human right, much like, you know, uh, security is, or, you know, uh, uh, you know, right to, uh, um, you know, freedom and so on and so forth. So in that sense, we've got to look at it as something that essential that the government provides. Let me just finish two more points and I'll 
turn it over back to you in terms of the priorities of the global fund and where the business comes in. The third one, I think, is quite interesting because one of the things that is interesting to me, having come from the private sector and been quite involved in global health, is that the business can bring a lot of practices that actually do not exist in largely the public, public sector and also certainly not in some of the multilateral agencies. The Global Fund was designed to be a flexible, innovative organization outside the United Nations system, Peter, even if I may say so, so that it is actually doesn't adopt the characteristics of many of the UN agencies. And I see some risk of the Global Fund drifting toward becoming one of these classic multilateral agencies that are not as efficient. So in that sense, one of the priorities and where business can help is to bring those kind of disciplines into the Global Fund. The last thing I want to say, and then I'll stop in a minute, is that, you know, we have to set some real priorities and some real aspirations, and Peter has been at the forefront of it, and I pick one related example in, uh, in AIDS. One thing we know how to stop, AIDS is a complex disease, but we do know how to stop mother-to-child transmission. And, you know, it is all the, all the tools are available. And yet, you know, even after many years of trying, we are really not making a big dent in it. And I think in some ways, that is a shame when you have all the tools available. And yet, uh, we are not making a difference as much as we could. And we know we can do it. So, there I think we really need to bring not only set those aspirations, but bring in the business community, bring in the kind of practices that will create the kind of universal distribution we need to once and for all eliminate mother-to-child transmission. Just as a simple pointer, I think I'll, I'll say that. Bosha, uh, you're not only in the private sector, you're not only uh, a Chinese citizen operating in this country, but you're in the pharmaceutical field. Uh, so, I wouldn't say there's a conflict of interest there, but there are certainly some very interesting questions. And I would like to start by asking you briefly, and of course we all know you're not a Chinese official, uh, but still, tell us what is the situation in China today? We know that uh, the authorities in this country came to acknowledge uh, HIV AIDS rather late in time, I think in the mid 90s. Uh, so what is the situation now? Especially with the three M's that uh, Peter was uh, referring to earlier. Well, since I'm the only Chinese on this panel, I guess that responsibility of talking about China falls to me, though I'm probably not very qualified to talk about it. Um, the, uh, no, the AIDS situation today, if you look at the static picture today, is not a very horrendous picture. Um, you know, it's about, depending on which number you look at, you know, million or maybe two of HIV carriers, maybe more. Uh, I would say the number is between one to five, maybe something like that. Maybe. One million. Yeah, you know, so then the most recent number I saw is one million as of two, three years ago. So I don't know what the most recent number is. Um, the death from uh, AIDS is, uh, the last number I saw is 27,000 a year. Uh, I don't know what the most recent number is. It's hard to get that number. Um, and however, the number is growing very quickly. And um, there are estimates that in a few years, uh, the HIV carrier number could be as high as 10 million. Um, uh, but again, it depends on which number you believe and whose number you believe. Uh, AIDS today in China is a fairly regionally concentrated matter. So in a few pockets in geography, it's serious, but it's not a nationwide issue right now. Um, another thing is the, the method of uh, a transmission has been primary in drug-related usages, um, you know, needles, primary unclean needles, uh, that there is most, you know, most usages, you know, people think that the washing needles in cold water would, or even hot water would solve the problem, and it didn't, and, and that's why also why it's concentrated, because it concentrates where drug usage is the most prevalent. The the scary picture in the future is that, uh, you know, China is in the beginning of the S-curve in penetration. 
And uh, as all these S curves go, when you know we are, if we enter into the vertical part, uh, the numbers could significantly significant get bigger. And that's what happened in many other countries. So we have this forewarning of almost what's going to happen. Um, and another thing is, as uh, Peter mentioned, that there is a large migrant population which makes this kind of disease much, much harder to contain, much easier to spread. Um, so we certainly should look at the longer term picture and not say, hey, you know, it's not a huge problem today, uh, but uh, we should definitely take steps to prevent the same stuff from happening in China. Is, um, is, the, uh, is the priority given in China today to treatment? or to prevention, and are there the, uh, the means to, to try and address both dimensions of the issue? I mean, I'm speaking as a private citizen, uh, and my knowledge to be other, the policy is rel relatively limited. What I would say is that certainly uh, both the drug issue and also the HIV issue is not an issue that it's often discussed in the public arena, and therefore, it's hard to have a rational discussion about what needs to be done, and uh, particularly on prevention. Prevention requires a lot of education of needle usage during drug drug, drug usage. Uh, you know uh, why HIV. You know and all the education about non-discrimination and all that. But you cannot do education and all that unless the issue is is, is wide open in the public domain. And I think that's a very very significant challenge. Uh, for us going forward, uh, you know, me speaking as a private person. Uh, I'd like to make two quick points uh, about, uh, you know, some of my thoughts about what to do about this in the short term, long term, primarily coming from my perspective as a citizen and also as a pharmaceutical executive. I used to be IT, so I'll bring some of that uh, experience to this as well. Uh, the first thing I would say is that having said that HIV is a huge issue. It's, it's going to be a significant issue we need to worry about. Today in China, we do need to look at what are causing the most suffering today. And, and some of the old infectious diseases, which has been largely eradicated outside China in the world, but in China, I think it's, it's a particularly acute problem because of the size of the problem and also the lack of resources. So you know, during the Dalian summit, in the three days, 5,000 people died from hepatitis B. Uh, you know, related complications in the past for three days. And that's a very, very large number. It's a scary number to think about. So that's the first point I will make. Uh, not to say AIDS is not important, but I think we need to look at the bigger picture of asset allocation and resource allocation. And the second point I make is a longer term issue. So uh, I think the pharmaceutical industry is one of the few industries today in the world where it's first world cost solving third world problems. What I mean by that is if you look at the IT industry, a DVD player will get made in China now, or Malaysia, or whatever, costs $10 and serves both domestic consumers as well as US consumers who are willing to pay a lot more for it. But the cost is China. And as the global supply chain has is migrated to where it makes the most sense for each component of the value chain to go to. Pharmaceutical industry today largely is not. It's probably one of the few remaining industries that hasn't been impacted by globalization very much. So you have, you know, last year over $30 billion was spent on R&D getting trying to get to new chemical compounds. Twelve NCEs, new chemical entities, were in fact got through the entire process, got approved. So the per compound cost is several billion dollars. And as Peter, Peter Riley said, AIDS is not the last epidemic. We're going to have all sorts of new things coming online. If it's going to be, continue to be this kind of a cost to develop a treatment, how would third world countries, which are going to be where the bulk of the cases by definition will occur because of the size of the population and the lack of health care and all that will occur, how do third world countries pay for these treatments, which cost so much to, to develop and the pharmaceutical com companies justly, widely want to charge for? And the solution, obviously, is for a true globalization of, of pharmaceutical industry, which require many constituencies, certainly some of it business to participate. Could be government need to be less protectionist, so they will let you know, outsourcing of various components of the value chain. I, IP protection need to be better in China, so people will trust China more. 
business and to willing to take a bet, as IT businesses have done successfully to move these various pieces in developing countries, et cetera, et cetera. So it seems unrelated to the AIDS problem, but in fact, if we think about how do we solve the human suffering issue long term as new diseases come, uh, I think without this fundamental reshuffling, which I think will happen, is happening, we will continue to have a huge issue in healthcare in developing countries. So that's a very good point, but indeed there's, there's a rather hopeful trend, uh, because between the first countries and the third countries, you have the second countries. <laughs> and indeed, uh, there is a shift now in some countries like Brazil and indeed India, uh, with some very difficult fights between big pharmaceutical companies on patents, uh, but indeed, uh, you know, there are now uh, low-cost drugs being produced in those countries, and that may indeed be, if not a solution, at least a, a helpful and hopeful trend, uh, which can help the third world countries to acquire uh, medicine at a much lower cost. Wouldn't may you I agree? To that quickly? I think um, the f it shouldn't be a fight. The reason today is a fight is because a local country wants to get a $100 treatment for $10. So therefore, they fight with the pharmaceutical company and say, we are poor, you got to give us for a lower price. Uh, they will say, we, uh, another case would be local companies are copycatting these multinational companies and try to get products locally produced as generic before the patent expires. Therefore, it's another kind of fight. But if things work well, it shouldn't be a fight. Local companies should be willing, be, have the ability to develop their own original stuff from the beginning rather than copycatting other people's. Multinationals from day one should be using local capacity in India, in China, in South Africa to do clinical trials. And therefore, it becomes part of the process rather than you know, multinationals are out front investing all this money and then developing countries say, well, you've got to give us for free or you know, we're going to copy you and then we are justified doing it because we have this need to treat our population. It shouldn't be a fight. Renat Talirad, you uh, are the executive director of the Helen Sussman Foundation in South Africa. Um, HIV AIDS is a disease of inequality, as uh, Peter Piot put it uh, earlier. Uh, it also has obvious cultural and political dimensions, and in your country in particular, there have been some extraordinary quarrels. Uh, indeed, I think the president of South Africa some time ago uh, said some very strange things about the very nature of the disease, and then he reverted to a, non, a more sort of, how could I put it politely, uh, uh, a more Yes, obvious definition of the disease. How would you say, in cultural and political terms, uh, how would you say the problem is now tackled in South Africa? Well, I wouldn't cast it necessarily in cultural and political terms. I certainly would cast it in human rights terms. In South Africa, our constitution protects the right to health as part of the socioeconomic generation of rights that are protected in our constitution. Our country has been in the limelight on this topic by virtue of being one of the epicenters of this disease and by virtue of, I would call it, the lack of leadership that we have seen in the public sphere on this topic. And I think one of the interesting aspects of the South African case has been the extent to which business at a crucial moment stepped into the breach of leadership and provided leadership quite effectively. And not only leadership in abstract terms, but leadership in concrete terms, in terms of treatment provisioning, in terms of providing antiretroviral drugs, in terms of providing counseling, and indeed in terms of providing free testing and voluntary testing. The essence of that particular message really is to show that leadership is a shared burden if one understands that the impact of this disease is not only in human terms, but it certainly is also in economic terms, a burden that is shared by the public and private sphere and that therefore the PPP route or the public-private route that you refer to and the partnership route is the route in which leadership is to be offered. The South African case has been a sad one for the absence of leadership from the public sphere, but the encouraging part has been that the private sector had risen to the occasion when it mattered. And I think that the arena in which the private sector can 
provide not only leadership, but the emphasis always being on treatment as it has been in relation to development of drugs, but also in relation to providing drugs, is not the only aspect of uh, business uh, corporate sector leadership that one could see. I think if one looks at saving lives, one also has to look at saving lives of future generations or the younger generations in terms of awareness campaigns and asking core questions about whether or not we are reaching younger generations through the awareness campaigns and what creative routes for public-private sector partnerships they can be in raising awareness in schools and in younger generation on the preventive side of the role that business can play above and beyond the role that business is already playing on the, on the treatment side and in terms of providing leadership in areas or countries where it may be lacking in the public sector. Thank you very much. Let, let's now turn to, to the floor and I will start with you, Sir Martin Sorel. I think you have some strong views about the issue, how business can actually help tackling the HIV I, Apologies that I only came in late because we had the press conference, but, and it's a bit difficult to, um, to comment because I haven't heard, I heard the excellent last two speakers, I haven't heard uh, enough, so I, I, I beg forgiveness if I'm repeating uh, what um, just, just a couple of observations very quickly. Um, if we looked at the challenges that face us, I think you can broadly define them as uh, lack of political will, which has been referred to, lack of funding, lack of a healthcare infrastructure, ignorance about the causes and a lack of debate uh, uh, of the causes of HIV and AIDS, uh, and stigma and discrimination that prevent people coming forward for testing and treatment. Uh, and in light of that, we see two key challenges, uh, certainly in the communications world. Firstly, to get world leaders to recognize that HIV AIDS is one of the two global priorities, the other being climate change. Secondly, to communicate and educate and tackle the stigma and discrimination at a national government and community level. Uh, and we think there are three main opportunities for companies that can help tackle the AIDS ep epidemic. Firstly, a more productive w uh, workforce in the affected regions. Uh, a better business environment, including greater economic development and social stability. And finally, and not least, reputational benefits. Now, what, what can the new business champions, because after all, D Dalian is about the new champions, what are the sort of things that they can do to help uh, solve some of these issues? The first thing is clearly political lobbying and advocacy. The second, obviously, is money, funding. The third is employee education and healthcare. And finally, using their products and expertise, for example, in the pharmaceutical industry, to find new solutions to the AIDS epidemic. Uh, the role that companies can play can vary as much on the nature of their business. Pharmaceutical companies can obviously make a con contribution to R&D. Countries with a major presence in the affected regions can support AIDS advocacy and lobbying efforts and logistics companies can support the delivery of medicines. Uh, ignorance and discrimination are the major barriers to effective prevention uh, and treatment of AIDS. And communications companies such as ours and our, our competitors as well are well placed to support awareness and education efforts. Let me just finish by concentrating on some of the new things that we see happening in terms of services and delivery solutions uh, that, that, are, that are, are being employed. There are endless possible solutions. Uh, business, with its ability to adapt rapidly to new situations, is very well placed to be in the forefront of these innovations. Solutions to AIDS are starting to be tailored in individual ways in the developing world in emerging market settings and reflect local cultural and religious norms and beliefs. Many, many businesses, such as our own clients, Vodafone and Unilever, have, for example, started to adopt what we call base of the pyramid solutions in order to do business in Africa and Asia. Uh, a similar mindset will be needed to find solutions that are affected, effective in tackling HIV and AIDS. For example, with distribution networks that reach into the world's remotest locations, companies could play an important role in overcoming infrastructure and logistical problems that restrict access to condoms and prevent infected people receiving treatment. For example, in one African country, the UN, uh, has been using Unilever's distribution system to get condoms to rural villages. We have, for example, in India, uh, a rural sales force of about 35,000 people. Uh, and intriguingly, here in, in China, we have a relationship with the Young Communist League uh, to, to develop programs 
uh, and the Young Communist League has membership, I think it's of 70 million people here in China. Now, new mis business models are obviously going to be needed. For instance, it's been suggested that public-private partnerships could you be used in, uh, that are used in drug discovery for developing world diseases could be used to help build healthcare infrastructure and delivery mechanisms in countries affected by HIV and AIDS. Uh, I certainly, the UN, would like to see solutions that are integrated into wider development plans and existing social structures. Uh, one example, interesting example, is the use of women's microcredit organizations. These can be used to empower and educate women on a wide range of subjects, including health. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Any questions from uh, the floor? If you could just uh, stand up, say who you are and your affiliation, please. Yes, sir. Yes, in the back. Yep. I, I'm Jack Sim from the World Toilet Organization. Uh, like Bo Shao has spoken up, AIDS is not the only disease, but it's very sexy because some um, movie star has died of it. But no movie star has died of diarrhea. And diarrhea kills 2 million a year. And it is this kind of trends and fashions about some disease that takes center stage, gets limelight, and other diseases uh, that stay in the shadow and nobody fund them, nobody cares about it. I'm quite worried that if we continue to treat diseases as fashionable and not fashionable, we must always remember both kills and people still die. So please, next year is UN International Year for Sanitation. Please pay some attention of sanitation as the cheapest preventive medicine in the world. Thank you. And of course, WHO and other organizations uh, are supposed to see to that. Peter, do you want to react to this remark? Well, it's not a, sorry, this is, it's not a competition among diseases. Um, when you look at it, uh, as I mentioned, uh, out of nothing, it has made it to, <clears throat> unfortunately, the fourth cause of death in the world. I mean, that tells the story in itself. Uh, and as I mentioned, it's the, the age group that makes a difference. But I, we, we approach AIDS not as a, one of many diseases or health problem. It's fundamentally, it's a problem for development. It's a security issue. And uh, that's the league where, uh, where it belongs. But I don't think that uh, we, we should go into this kind of absurd uh, competition. Uh, for example, when you look at uh, the fact that the status of health systems uh, is really bad in, in, in many developing countries, which is true, when you look what has been done it, uh, over the last five to ten years, um, it is because of uh, action on AIDS. Uh, treatment introduction. I mean, all the talk and the volumes that have been filled over, you know, about strengthening health systems was pretty academic talk. With AIDS, because of the leadership, because of the, um, the funding available and the activism, has really moved things. And uh, I think that we can learn a lot. And with AIDS, there's good politics and bad politics. From day one, it has been very politicized. And I think because it's about sex and drugs. And it's because of politics that there is the money, the commitment. It's also because of politics that money is wasted on, for example, abstinence-only programs, which we know are a waste of taxpayers' money, doesn't work, um, or resistance to um, uh, dealing with injecting drug use. As Bo, Bo has said, I think the, the state council and the, the, the top leadership in, in China, for example, took a very courageous decision two years ago to go for a resolutely uh, modern, a progressive approach when it comes to injecting drug use. And I wish the whole of Asia would do that. Another question? No one? No business leader, no uh, new champion who wants to express himself or herself about this issue? Well, 
I think we will uh, then, if not uh, conclude, because it's impossible to conclude, but maybe I will ask you, Mr. Gupka, what could you tell our audience? What would you say are the three arguments to entice business to get more involved in public health issues? I'm asking you. Well, you know, first to say that it is completely in enlightened self-interest of business to do it. I mean, there is no question the impact of this disease and several others on the health of the workforce, the general productivity of the economy, security of, uh, you know, we've gone through that. So it is enlightened self-interest is absolutely the first point I'd make. The second point I'd make is that business has a set of capabilities that are solely needed to fight the disease. It was often the perception that health is a public good, it should be only provided by the government, they can do it. That is not the case. Clearly, pharmaceutical companies are part of the solution. Business is part of the solution. Oftentimes, both government and civil society have treated business with you know, some suspicion about either motives or I, I think that should go away because without working together, we cannot solve it and business does bring a set of capabilities. So that's the, that's the second point. And the third point I'd simply say is that, you know, if you think about what you do and ultimately you want to have real impact, you got to think about it in a broader societal sense. So I do bring in the responsibility of business towards society and making a contribution that one would be proud of to say I made a difference in this very important arena. Thank you very much indeed. I think we could all uh, join in thanking our panel for having provided a, a rather complete uh, picture, if not of the HIV AIDS uh, complete issue in the world, but at least of the need for each of us to get involved. Thank you very much indeed to you all.